Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dr. Randy Siebel, President and CEO of the Better Health Partnership and a very proud City Club member, Dan. Um, Better Health is a regional health improvement partnership of primary care practices in Northeast Ohio. Our vision is a Northeast Ohio that's a healthier place to live and a better place to do business. We share this vision with employers, with health plans, our patients, and public policymakers. And we believe that engaging all of our partners is critical to achieving our vision. Because of this, it's my special pleasure to, in, to introduce Dr. Tom Farley. Tom is a pediatrician and epidemiologist trained at the CDC and a marathoner having run the New York Marathon, I just found out five times. He's currently, the, he's currently the CEO of the, public, of, the, of the Public Good Projects, which is a nonprofit organization that leverages the power of mass media and marketing to combat the nation's largest health problems. As important for today's talk, Tom was commissioner of New York City's Department of Health, having served under Mayor Bloomberg's leadership between 2009 and 2014. And effective two weeks from now, Tom will, Tom will become the new commissioner of health for the city of Philadelphia. Uh, most of us think about our departments of health as the overseers of the safety and of our communities and preparedness for emergencies, and we count on them for these functions. During my lifetime, long one, um, health departments helped us eradicate polio, dramatically reduce the, the risk and the consequences of tuberculosis, effectively responded to the HIV AIDS epidemic, and more recently, uh, a potential Ebola virus epidemic. And as we sit here this afternoon, public health officials are planning our strategies to limit Americans' exposure to the Zika virus, yesterday declared an international emergency by the World Health Organization. As health commissioner, Tom was responsible for the oversight of over 6,000 employees who address these types of issues every day. But for, at the same time, New York's team began to attack the causes of chronic diseases that are the major reasons for death and disability in the modern world. These diseases like cancer and heart disease. In this time with New York, in his time with New York City's Health Department, Dr. Farley advocated for innovative public health policies to address these problems, including making the city's parks and beaches smoke free, raising the legal sales age of tobacco to 21, restricting the burning of air polluting dirty fuels to heat buildings. Also under Major Mayor Bloomberg's watchful eye, four separate cigarette taxes were initiated in 2002, not too long after the September 11th attacks on the World Trade Centers. These were bold steps at a very tumultuous time, to say the least. Cigarettes are now $14 per pack in New York City. <laughs> Highest in the country. With over 8 million people, New York is now rightly considered one of the healthiest cities to live in in the United States. Its approach, led by a billionaire mayor and activist doctors, leading cha led change in healthcare policy is described in Dr. Farley's 2015 book, Saving Gotham. Very good book. I'm delighted that Tom has agreed to share his insights from this really remarkable era. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas Farley. Thank you very much, Randy, and uh, thank you for inviting me, and I also want to thank Dan for inviting me to speak at this uh, really um, famous institution. I, I learned earlier about the number of presidents that spoke here, uh, future or former presidents, so I guess I should clarify, especially given the season, that I'm not running for president, <laughs> uh, either as Republican or Democrat. I'm not going to try a third party run. Um, I know that that's many people think about these de that these days, but not me. I, I am a public health guy. Uh, start to finish. Uh, I will do public health till my dying day. Um, and so I enjoy any opportunity to talk about public health. And I said to, to Randy in an email um, uh, a few days ago that whenever you get this many people in a room, 
talking about population health, uh, you've already got a success. Uh, this is something which uh, that's time has come, and it's really exciting to see many people focusing on that issue. Now, I was fortunate enough to be working in New York City in what I think of as the golden age of public health, uh, under a mayor, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, who took seriously his, his responsibility to promote the health of residents, and understood the principles and the methods of public health, and was willing or even eager to take on the controversies that public health necessarily brings. Public health is always controversial. Um, and I'm going to talk more about what we did in New York City in a minute, but uh, first I want to start by explaining the title of my talk about population health. And I want to work my way there with a couple of observations that are not new, uh, but that they're so important that I think they deserve us thinking a little more about than we tend to. The first is that this country, uh, which is the wealthiest nation in the history of the Earth, is not healthy. If you look at uh, our infant mortality, we have rates that are about twice that of countries like England and France and Germany. Our life expectancy uh, rank among high-income countries in the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Develop Development, there's 34 countries there, we rank 27th out of those 34. That's between Chile and the Czech Republic, and it is well below Italy, Greece, South Korea, and Slovenia. Now, I have no problem with those countries. They are wonderful countries, but it is pretty embarrassing that our rank is below them in this signature health statistic. And what's worth is we're actually falling further behind. Our health statistics are improving, but the rest of the world is improving faster than we are. They are surpassing us. So I can only conclude from this that Americans are suffer from disease unnecessarily, and they are dying before their time. So that's observation number one. Observation number two is that this is happening despite the fact that we are spending much more than other high-income countries for our health care, uh, roughly twice as much per capita as what other high-income countries are paying. That ends up being, in this country, $9,500 per person per year. Now, uh, that's something which we tend not to notice because it comes out of our pockets in so many different ways, but we all pay that. We pay that in our health insurance premiums, we pay that out of pocket when we have coinsurance and co-pays with medical care, and we pay it in our taxes for Medicare and Medicaid. Now, individually, that amount of money is a lot. Uh, think about this for a moment. What would it do for you, or what would it do for a struggling family if we could pay half of that, which is what the other high-income countries, countries of the world pay? That would mean you'd be roughly saving $5,000 per year. That's per person, though, not per household. So for a struggling family of four, this means they might have $20,000 extra dollars per year to spend on things like housing and education and other sick family members and their future. What would it do for them? So individually, that's a lot. But even for government, that's a lot. It means it's much harder for government to pay for other crucial needs, like schools and colleges and roads and bridges. You know, there's not a coincidence that between 2000 and 2014, the increase in the state share of the budget, uh, the, bu the share of the state's budget that was used for Medicaid matched the decrease in the state share of the budget for K-12 education. So our medical costs are crowding out education. Now, even if our only interest in society was health, um, and I'm a health guy, but I think it isn't only health, even if our only interest in health that's a mistake because, you know, education leads to health. There's no question that people who are more educated are, end up being healthier. Education is so much more, though. It is our future. So we are shortchanging our children and shortchanging our future to pay medical costs today. So this combination of our bad health statistics, despite these crushing costs, is a big problem. It's a long-standing, deep-seated problem. It's not something that we're going to turn around in the next year or so. Uh, It'll certainly take years, but we ought to take on that problem. And fixing it is going to take big changes. Uh, so we ought to be thinking about what are the big things we can do to really change the trajectory of health in this country. Well, what as a society are we doing about it? Uh, the biggest thing that's happened in health in this country over the last few years, you might say over the last few decades, is the Affordable Care Act. What's the Affordable Care Act uh, doing? Well, it's, it's structured to do basically three things. Uh, that is to increase 
access to health care by increasing health insurance coverage, and to slow the growth in costs, and to improve the quality of health care with the hope that that improved quality is going to help people be healthier. And it's got many features. It's a long bill, you know, about 1,000 pages. Uh, it's, in many ways, it's actually succeeding, uh, right? It is increasing coverage. It is slowing the, reduce, uh, slowing the increase in health care costs, and it's improving quality. But it's not doing everything. Now, one of the things that the Affordable Care Act is doing is that it has uh, required that hospitals, and to a lesser extent other health care providers, uh, increasingly to focus on what is labeled as population health. That's what's in my title, population health. Um, I interpret that to mean that they, these providers are increasingly being held uh, responsible for trying to improve these embarrassing health statistics like life expectancy. Now that, when you put that responsibility on providers, it brings to light uh, a really important truth. And that is that medical care, because it is given mainly after people get sick, does not impact how healthy a population is. And that's because most medical care starts, for the most part, when people get sick and they go to a doctor. So you wouldn't expect that to reduce the number of people who are going to get sick because it only happens after that event happens. And when people do get a diagnosis, these days often the, for the most common causes, uh, the most common illnesses, medical care cannot cure them, right? We, our biggest killers for the most part today are not curable for all of the wonders of medicine. Most of the time we're not curing cancer, we are not curing diabetes, most of the time we are not curing heart disease. We are treating those and there's a benefit to people receiving that medical care but we're not curing those. Now, I believe in medical care. Um, I'm a doctor. When I get sick, I want to go to a good doctor. So I'm not knocking medical care, but we should be honest that our medical care system is not going to have much impact on our life expectancy. Or to put it another way, health and health care are different. We can have lots of health care, but not health, and we can have health, but have very little health care. I think we want both, but unfortunately our conversations about health often get diverted into discussions around health care. Well, then what does have an impact on population health if it's not health care? Or to put it another way, well, how can we actually improve those embarrassing health statistics? Well, to do that, we means, it means we need to actually prevent diseases like cancer and diabetes in the first place. Uh, prevention starts when we're not with thinking about what are people coming to, for care for, what they're, they're, what's driving them to the doctor, but what's causing them to get those diseases uh, in the first place. <laughs> Well, we know our biggest killers today are chronic diseases, right? They're heart disease and cancer and diabetes, chronic lung disease. We don't know everything about these diseases, but we know an awful lot. Uh, we know certain risk factors that greatly increase the likelihood that people are going to get those diseases, and we know how common those risk factors are. There end up being five or six, depending on how you count them, risk factors that together, roughly, might be, we might be able to attribute half of our deaths to. Smoking unhealthy diet and all the different ways a diet can be unhealthy, physical inactivity, use of alcohol and other drugs, um, and air pollution makes that list as well. These are things that we know an awful lot about and we know ways to try to reduce those risk factors which would have an impact on population health. So that's what we need to focus on. Then that gets the question of in whom? Uh, in whom should we focus on those? Who is the population that hospitals these days are increasingly asked to help? It seems like a minor question, but it's actually uh, a big question, and the answer is pretty crucial. That hospitals are increasingly asked not just to focus on the people who show up. Nonprofit hospitals, in fact, these days are required to uh, do something for the community benefit. And as part of that, they need to report to the Internal Revenue Service what they've done for the community benefit. And the IRS has defined the population they're supposed to be responsible for. It's kind of funny that the IRS would be weighing in on this issue, but they are. <laughs> and the population that hospitals are responsible for are the people who, quote, need the care of the hospital, not just the current patients. Well, to me, those, that means that a person who has heart disease um, and is still smoking and never comes to the doctor He's now a hospital's responsibility. That means that the population that a hospital is supposed to be responsible for, to me, is a geographic population. It's the catchment population of a hospital. And I suspect I have a few hospital people here in the room today, and if I were to ask you, 
what's your catchment population? Where do you draw your patients from? I would guess that most hospitals would say we draw them from the entire metropolitan area. Okay, so that means you're now responsible for the population of the entire metropolitan area. Well, that's radically different from what hospitals have taken responsibility for before. So that brings me now to the question of my title. What would it really take to improve population health? How can we actually improve the health of an entire metropolitan area? We grab our arms around that population. The numbers are pretty daunting. Um, I went through this earlier today, but just to, to give you a sense, in Cuyahoga County alone, we have roughly 280,000 smokers. We have roughly 320,000 people who are obese. That's not counting the people who are also overweight. So uh, an individual hospital or anybody else doing prevention, it's pretty hard for them to wrap their heads around how you could reach that many people. It's very expensive to do it one-on-one -on -one through medical care. Just to give you a rough sense of the numbers here, I estimated once, okay, what would it cost to have a one-on-one -on -one interaction for, let's say, 20 minutes uh, with 1,000 people to counsel them to, oh, say, let's say, quit smoking? You know, maybe $16,000. Okay, what if you did a, some sort of community program where you went out and tried to contact people on the street? It's still going to be in the thousands of dollars per thousand people. So that means that when organizations do prevention programs or community programs, they tend to do programs that reach 100 people or 1,000 people, which may seem, feel like a lot to reach 1,000 people, but in fact is thinking way too small. So there's a fact here, there's a pretty brutal fact that we really need to face, and that is these numbers. If you got 1,000 smokers in Cuyahoga County to quit smoking today, the effect on population health would be negligible, okay? It's nothing. We need to think bigger than that, so much bigger that it's not just a quantitative exercise, we need to think qualitatively different. And I think thinking too small is the biggest mistake that I see in, in health. We need to think as big as the problems we are trying to solve. So how do you reach 300,000 people? Well, there are two ways. Uh, one of them is what I'm going to call, uh, it, which is to, is to change the world around people that naturally makes it easier for them to be healthy. That goes under the label of policy and environmental change. Makes healthy choices easier and unhealthy choices maybe a little bit more difficult. For example, prohibiting smoking in restaurants and bars change the whole social acceptability of smoking. So the current smokers are more likely to quit. New people are less likely to take up smoking in the first place. It really changed the world. That one policy which cost essentially nothing. The second way you can do this is through messages in the mass media. So mass media messages can reach everyone. I told you a minute ago it might cost $16,000 to reach people one-on-one -on -one through a counseling session in a doctor's office. A 30-second ad on television can reach 1,000 people for $35. Okay. Uh, that's 300 times less. Now, you might say that a 30-second ad on television is not as intensive and therefore not as impactful as a counseling session with a physician, and I would agree with you. But is it 300 times less impactful? No, it isn't. So that then brings me now to how we try to use those tools, uh, policy and environmental change and mass media messaging, uh, to promote health in New York City. Uh, first, a little background. Mayor Bloomberg uh, came in. He's a billionaire businessman. He made his money giving people uh, data which they used to make better investment decisions. He came into his uh, job as mayor of New York City with a belief in prevention and uh, an understanding that public health is a way to save lives wholesale rather than retail, okay, and that it's far more cost effective than medical care. He's a numbers guy, and he saw public health and it's the value in the numbers. And he hired a man named Tom Frieden, uh, who is now the director for the Centers for Disease Control. He was my predecessor. Uh, he's a public health expert who had fought tuberculosis uh, first in New York City and then in India. And Tom Frieden was obsessed with counting how many lives he saved. Uh, so he was also a numbers guy. And the two of them had an immediate mind meld, okay? And they ret retained a partnership that lasted for eight years as when Tom was health commissioner. And they start, started in a lot of big things, and I had the advantage of coming in and just sort of continuing what was in motion. The idea of tackling health in a population of 8 million people. Uh, to give you a sense of the numbers there, we had 1.3 million smokers when the Bloomberg administration came in, and a million people who were obese. And this is how we did it over a 12-year period, that was three terms of Mayor Bloomberg. 
First, smoking is something that Tom Frieden came in thinking this is the biggest underlying killer in New York City, and so he was, it's going to be absolutely the top of his priority. He estimated that it was roughly killing 10,000 people per year in New York. And he viewed every one of those deaths as preventable, just as if somebody was having uh, you know, a cardiac arrest in the emergency department, it was an emergency to solve them. He saw that for all of those 10,000 people who were smoking. And so we put, a, put in place a strategy on smoking uh, which started with three key elements, and I added a couple later on. And the three elements that we started out first were tax increases. As Randy mentioned earlier, uh, city and state taxes, and so that there were a series of tax increases that happened during those years. The city tax increased from eight cents uh, when the Bloomberg administration came in to $1.50, and the New York state tax increased from $1.11 to $4.35. Uh, and so the price of the pack you've now heard, um, I think you can probably get some at $12 a pack, but it's an awful lot more than what was roughly $5 a pack when the administration first came in. Second was the Smoke Free Air Act, uh, making bars and restaurants smoke free in particular. <laughs> now that's a norm now, we expect that, but at the time this was a truly radical idea. People went to bars almost as much to smoke as they did to drink. How could you tell someone that they couldn't go to a bar and just light up a cigarette at the bar? Um, it was bitterly fought. Uh, people said it wasn't going to happen, and this happened at a time when people were focused on recovering from 9-11. Mayor Bloomberg stayed the course, um, the rule went through, and the social norm changed within a matter of a couple of months. People quickly got to like the idea that you could go to a bar or restaurant and have a drink or a meal and not come out smelling like smoke and not come out coughing. Um, and the staff that worked at those places kind of appreciated too that they weren't coughing at the end of a long shift. The third element was running, using mass media, running counter advertisements on television to counter the positive images on smoking that we otherwise get a lot of in media. Now initially the health department tried a, uh, a positive cell campaign. It was, it, you didn't hear about it uh, because it wasn't effective. It was called Everybody Loves a Quitter. And <laughs> the idea was it was showing people how wonderful your life would be and how much your family members would love and appreciate you if you would only quit smoking. Great idea, people liked it in focus groups, didn't work at all. So the health department went to very graphic negative ads on the health consequences of smoking. There was the campaign highlighting a man named Ronaldo, a man who had had his larynx removed from laryngeal cancer and had to live with a hole in his throat, uh, and it showed how difficult it was for him in a very graphic way that really touched people. Uh, later we had a series of ads highlighting a woman named Marie who had had multiple amputations of her fingers from a complication of smoking called Berger's disease. In the end, the, the health department at its peak spent about $8 million a year placing ads in New York City. It may sound like a lot, but it ends up being a dollar per capita per year, which really isn't that much money compared to certainly what we spend on medical care. So that was what we did for the first few years. Uh, towards the end, we added two other elements to this. One of them is that we prohibited discounting of cigarettes at retail. Uh, the cigarette companies are doing various things to get smokers to buy uh, cigarettes at impulse. Uh, special price, buy one, get one free, get this $2 off coupon, we prohibited those. Um, those things, uh, the tobacco companies are putting billions into that so that must work. And the second thing we did was uh, raise the, the legal sales age from 18 to 21. And the rationale for that was simple, that roughly 90% of smokers uh, start before they're 21. So if we can prevent them from starting that point, they may never start. And over the long term, this might have a huge impact on the total number of smokers. So what was the effect of all this on smoking? The effect really was stunning. When Tom Frieden came in, smoking rates in New York City had been about 21.5% for a decade. They weren't moving. Uh, between 2002 and 2014, smoking rates had now fallen to 14%. That is 400,000 fewer smokers. So by a few steps that are qualitatively different from what we do in medical care, he was able to change the health of an entire population in the city of 8 million people. Then the health department took on the issue of unhealthy diet and obesity. Uh, obesity was an epidemic that had more than doubled between 1980 and 2000. It was, we thought, the second biggest killer after smoking. It was driving an epidemic of diabetes where it got to the point where one in eight adults in New York City had diabetes. Now, a few decades ago, it might be uh, one in 50. It's causing more than 2,000 people to have to have amputations per year. This is not a minor problem. We recognized there wasn't any single thing that we were going to do that would reverse this decades-long epidemic. 
Uh, so the health department started doing a series of partial things. The first step was to provide people basic information for those people who were motivated and didn't want to uh, gain weight or might want to lose weight, uh, information they could use, and that was to provide them calorie counts when they went to chain restaurants. Uh, before we started this, you could pick up a package of food in the grocery store and turn it over, and with a little calculating, you could pretty much figure out how many calories were in that food. But if you went into a restaurant, you were, at l you were lost. So the rule required uh, the calorie counts on menus and menu boards of chain restaurants. The, uh, then the uh, uh, health department took on the issue of sugary drinks, recognizing that sugary drinks were not the entire epi obesity epidemic, but they were the biggest single contributor to the epidemic, and they weren't recognized as such. There was roughly a tripling of consumption between 1980 and 2000 when we had the biggest run-up of obesity. And so in taking on sugary drinks, we tried to follow the model we had done with tobacco, which was very successful. We proposed to tax them in the same way that we proposed to tax cigarettes. One cent per ounce. Uh, so that encouraged people to purchase smaller portions or to switch something to something that didn't have sugar in it. We later proposed to prohibit sugary drinks from the food stamp program, now called the SNAP program for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. The idea that government shouldn't subsidize people to buy something which we know is very bad for their health and a contributor to the biggest nutrition problem that there is. Now, under our proposal, people would have gotten the same dollar value to their benefits. It wasn't cutting people's benefits. It's just that they would use those benefits for healthier items. And we proposed, as you might have heard, uh, a limit on the size of containers that in which we use uh, the sugar drinks were sold in restaurants. Now, all three of those policy proposals were beaten down by the soda companies. They hated the idea that actions that we took might actually reduce soda consumption. And they were very powerful. Uh, but every time we did a proposal like that, we generated a lot of publicity. And all the discussion of uh, soda taxes and uh, SNAP uh, limits on uh, sugary <coughs> drinks reinforced the idea that sugary drinks are bad for you, that they make you gain weight, they increase your risk of diabetes. And people were getting that in the news all the time. Now, we reinforced that message in the news media with ads on television that emphasized that sugary drinks make you gain weight. And as a result, uh, from surveys that we did, we showed that daily consumption of sugary drinks dropped by about a third, from 36% to 23% uh, over just a few years of the Bloomberg administration. So that's what we did on smoking. That's what we did on diet and obesity. And what were the health effects? The health effects were big. During the Bloomberg years, obesity rates started falling in children. Now, they're not falling fast. They're falling very, very slowly, in fact, but that's falling after about 30 years of steady increases. So that's an important inflection point. Our heart disease mortality rate fell 40 percent. All, our all-cause mortality rate fell 23 percent. Both of those declined faster than what was happening in the country as a whole. And life expectancy in New York City during the Bloomberg years uh, increased by 3.2 years. Now, that was the greatest rise of any city in the nation, of any large city in the nation. And at the same time, life expectancy in the country as a whole increased 1.8 years. So now the gap in life expectancy between New York City and the nation as a whole is 2.3 years, which is the biggest gap in history. So even in a population of a city of 8 million people, we were able to improve population health. It can be done with those very large numbers, but the approach is just very different from the way that we have been approaching health up until now. So a few lessons to, to be learned from this, I think. First lesson is something I mentioned before, that health is not the same as medical care. Improving population health is not health care access. It's not higher quality medical care. It's not better coordination of medical care. All those are important, but improving population health is a qualitatively different thing. It takes a totally different approach. Second is we have to think big. We have to think as big as the problems we are trying to solve. Don't try to solve a 300,000 person problem with a 1,000 person intervention. Third is that if we want to improve population health, there are basically two ways to do it. One is through policy change that makes healthy choices easier and that protects people from health risks. And the second is communications using mass media in a media age. Now, using mass media can be just using the news media, just talking about it, keeping uh, population health on the top of the agenda. But it also can be paid advertising, and we shouldn't be afraid to use that. 
Now, any community can do this. New York City is unique, but it is not unique in that way. All right, it's not unique in health. You don't need a billionaire mayor to improve population health. It is within the power, I think, of the people in this room to improve population health in the Cleveland area. Now, from what I hear, there's a lot of good things that are already happening towards that end here in the Cleveland area, and that's exciting. Now, if we improve population health city by city, uh, like this across the entire country, we can solve the problems that I started with. We can improve our health and become the healthiest nation on the earth, which is what we ought to be considering our economic strength. And at the same time, we can slow the growth in health care costs and have it be so the health care is not draining away our resources for other pressing social needs. What it takes, again, it's not a billionaire mayor, what it takes is unity of purpose. It takes a collection of people who have some amount of authority over this issue to agree on what they ought to be doing. They need to recognize the actions that will truly change population health and then bring the strengths of that community together to take those actions. And I need to say this, that also brings the strength of the community together to counteract those people who will inevitably resist change because there will inevitably be people who will resist anything that we do to improve population health uh, because there's always people benefiting from the status quo. So no one would be happier than me if Cleveland were to fully commit itself to improve population health and it, if it were to succeed and become a model for the rest of the country. So that's what I'm hoping you'll do and follow up to this conversation, and I can't wait to see how you do. Thanks very much. It sounds so easy. I'm Dan Malthrop, CEO of the City Club, and today we're enjoying a forum featuring Dr. Thomas Farley, former commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the current CEO of the Public Goods Project and about to become the Commissioner of Public Health for the City of Philadelphia. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, he's starting in two weeks, so that's a big deal. We encourage you to organize your questions for our speaker now and remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. If you're joining us via our webcast, and would like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club. Digital production is provided by our primary media partner. That's 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ PBS, 104.9 WCLV IdeaStream. Our partnership with IdeaStream is funded by PNC and Robert Conrad, with additional support from Cleveland State University and the Payne Fund. Be sure to join us this Friday, February 5th, as we welcome D. Michael Langford, National President of the Utility Workers Union of America, for a conversation on the importance of rebuilding our energy infrastructure for the 21st century. For more information about any of our upcoming or past forums, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Our community partner for today's forum is the Better Health Partnership. Our hospitality partner is the Metropolitan at the Nine Hotel. And sales of Dr. Farley's book, Saving Gotham, a billionaire mayor, activist doctors, and the fight for eight million lives are generously provided by a cultural exchange. We thank all of you for your partnership. Additionally, we welcome guests at tables hosted by, the Ca by Case Western Reserve University, Cleveland State University School of Nursing, Cleveland Clinic, Mount Sinai Healthcare Foundation, and the Center for Community Solutions. We thank you all for your support. I'd like to also welcome students to today's program from Gilmore Academy, Jane Addams Business Career Center, Shaw High School, and St. Ignatius High School. We're so glad to have you with us. Student participation is made. Student participation is made possible by the Lobb Foundation. Now it's time to return to Dr. Farley for the traditional City Club Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests and students. Holding our microphones today are Marketing and Outreach Fellow Faye Walker and Office Assistant Wesley Allen. May we have our first question, please? Uh, thank you, Dr. Farley, for coming uh, to the City Club of Cleveland and Cleveland. My name is Anthony Price. I'm a senior at Shaw High School. Um, and my question is, you, you talked about earlier about thinking big. What can teens do um, that are also sitting in the room and in the city of Cleveland do um, as to thinking big when to improving population health? Well, first I have to say, I wish I were as poised as you were when I was a senior in high school. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> uh, you know, teens have a really important role to play because those of us old folks um, ended up getting sort of 
caught in our ways and we tend to be aligned with a particular um, organization that we may represent or institution. And so it's sometimes hard for us to think with a clean slate on something. Uh, and uh, I, I've often found in talking to young people that they ask questions that never would have occurred to me that are maybe the most important questions to ask. So you should say, well, why is it that the world has to be this way? Why is it that we have to accept such and such? Uh, and you can speak with a clarity and an authenticity that the rest of us older people can't. So I would just say in general, think about what you think is wrong about the world and speak very clearly about that and, and push the older folks to, to take some action on it. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Petruba from uh, the Weatherhead School of Management. Um, I wanted to come back to uh, the forces that you mentioned who might be resistant to these kind of changes. Um, I'm not, not, I don't represent that group, uh, but maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe I'll channel them for a second. So uh, how do you respond to the criticism that some of the things that you did in, in, in New York um, are somehow antithetical to you know, certain values of, of libertarianism that that Americans hold dear, you know, like the, you know, the the fact that uh, even though people make mistakes, we generally allow them to do that. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I get questions like that a lot, and, and my answer is like this: I I was health commissioner for about four and a half years, and during that time, not a single person came up to me and said, "Please put trans fat back in my food." Uh, not a single person came up to me and said, "Please put secondhand smoke back in my restaurant." Uh, that any time you propose a change. To someone that says, wait a minute, you're actually you know, reducing human choice. Well, it isn't really. What you're, the changes we did were protecting people from adverse health risks. Any changes makes people a little unsettled, but once the change occurs, people recognize, oh, this is actually to my benefit and I like that. That's not to say that there isn't controversy. There always will be, but um, I think uh, in the end, people want a world that helps it, makes it easier for them to be healthy. Hi, uh, my name is Elizabeth Sump. I'm from the Cleveland Clinic, and I'm one of those big healthcare institutions that apparently doesn't focus on wellness. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think you know there are actually a lot of folks here from uh, from healthcare institutions uh, around the room. And and one of the questions that I had was CMS has recently released uh, a, a a funding opportunity around accountable health communities models, and so that's focused on getting to the socio demographic um, factors that influence health and wellness. Um, and it's a very high touch approach. Right. Um, I heard you talk about, you know, you need to be, in, in many cases, high tech and, and high communication. How do you believe, as many of the folks here are looking at those opportunities, we should be integrating around that combination of high touch and high communication to be at the best impact out of an opportunity like this? Yeah, I mean, one thing I should clarify it's, it's not that I'm against. Um, uh, the healthcare system, encouraging people to adopt healthy behaviors uh, when they interact with people. They absolutely should do that, and, and that's something, as a healthcare system, we don't do very well right now, we, even uh, as simple as telling patients they should quit smoking. So we should do that, um, but we should recognize that that is unlikely to have an impact on the total smoking rate of a population. And so if an institution really wants to think about population health, it has to say, well, how can we reach everybody? And so an institution could either pay for or chip in to pay for mass media messaging. There are big economies of scale for that, right? An, an individual hospital may say it's too expensive for us to produce an ad campaign, but if five hospitals share the same catchment population, and because they compete, we know they do, uh, they could all chip in and have one campaign that helps everybody. So I would view those as two things happen in parallel. If, I'm sorry, if I could just add that, you can also have a, an integrated campaign so the same messaging that people see on television is the messaging they get when that physician speaks to them, and that makes it even more powerful from a marketing standpoint. Yes, uh, I'm a family physician. You didn't mention guns. Is it, does it not matter or is it too hard? Uh, it absolutely matters. Um, guns are a public health problem, um, and they're susceptible to uh, public health solutions. Um, we've had huge declines in uh, deaths from car crashes in this country over the last few decades, and people still drive, right? So if we took a public health approach like that to guns, we could have it where still there are people who own guns, but we have many fewer gun deaths, and changing the way the guns are designed and changing the, the way that we go th people go through the process of acquiring and owning guns. Um, it's, it doesn't rank up there as the leading cause of death, but it does rank up there as causing a lot of deaths in young people um, and in affecting the society around those, uh, those shootings. So 
absolutely, we can follow the same basic principles there that we can for the others. So I wondered um, the statistics that the results that you uh, reported from New York City were those the same across racial and socioeconomic groups? Because my sense is that New York City has become a much wealthier city. So is, is some of this due to the fact people got forced out of the city because they couldn't afford to live there any longer? So how did it apply across those different groups? You know, I, I wondered that too. I said, gosh, are we exporting our poor people and that's why we're healthier as a city. But actually the, the proportion of people living in poverty uh, in New York City during the Bloomberg administration was flat. It, it did not decline at all. Uh, so I don't think that that was the reason. And getting to the question of what were the, the impact on health disparities, actually the disparities by race uh, narrowed during the Bloomberg administration. The we had a greater benefit in um, life expectancy among African Americans than we did among whites. Hi there. Um, what do you see as the private sector's role in all of this? Because you've spoken to the public se sector's role in public health. We as a private corporation want to help our population, but I've got to know the dollars and cents behind it. So talk to me about how you feel corporations can play a role. Yeah. You know, we had a discussion with this earlier today. Uh, employers, uh, so particularly those who are self-insured, are really on the hook for these health care costs. You're paying an awful lot as well. I don't think you as employers alone can solve this problem. I do think employers should be part of a larger committee, group, coalition, whatever, uh, weighing in to say, here's what we need to do to help our employees, to help society, and here's what, what we as employers can contribute. We can contribute some, but not the entire solution. I think employers in general have been left out of the discussion, uh, and so they should be part of it. But, but it needs to be a discussion that also includes healthcare providers and health plans and public health and, and these other sectors. Thank you for coming to uh, Cleveland, Dr. Farley. I wondered if you could talk a bit uh, from quotes from your book where you describe, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the powerhouse that was the, the New York City, it is the New York City health code, and some of the uh, historical perspective there and why that mattered. Also, the interaction between the Board of Health uh, at the City of New York and City Council and some of those dynamics and, and the role, perhaps, that the neutrality that the Board of Health played. Right. So the, the New York City Board of Health was established back in the 1800s when there were crises of infectious disease epidemics like cholera, and people were terrified, and there were some uh, bad experiences with a Board of Health that was run by elected officials. Uh, and so and sort of in the wake of those scandals, uh, they created a professional board of health uh, where people uh, more than half needed to have medical degrees and other people had to have scientific backgrounds. And it was they were appointed with a process that made sure that people had expertise in, in health. Um, and, and it was vested with a lot of authority. If you look at the, the wording of the rules, the, the board of health can do whatever needs to be done to address major health threats. Uh, and that's something that has used over the years, uh, which is authority which is separate from the city council. Uh, so the New York City Board of Health has done things like uh, prohibited lead paint uh, more than a decade before the federal government did. And it, so it saved probably tens of thousands of children from getting the kind of brain damage that we're worried about now in Flint. Um, the Board of Health required um, window guards. This is almost a New York City specific issue. We had an awful lot of toddlers were falling out of windows and to their deaths um, in upper story, multi-story buildings um, and uh, required for landlords to put window guards there, there so the children didn't fall out of windows uh, and immediately caused a great decline in the number of kids falling to their deaths. So these are things which you don't tend to think of as boards of health, which have been dealing with cholera getting into, but the Board of Health in New York City did that. That authority was something that the city council was somewhat jealous of. And there's been a certain amount of tension over the years between the, the city council, what its authority is and what the Board of Health's authority is. And there have been court cases that have um, have curtailed the power of the Board of Health. Nonetheless, it's an absolute gem of a resource that can take action uh, that is very strong, that has a force of law against major health threats beyond just infectious diseases. Um, and, and it has the expertise and the recognition to, to act um, uh, appropriately. So we, we, we were very excited by that. We've got a question from Twitter. Um, Cleveland and Cuyahoga Health Data Resource wants to know if increasing gentrification or changing demographics explain the increase in life expectancy. Yeah, this I tried to answer earlier. Again, the percentage of New Yorkers in poverty uh, didn't change during the Bloomberg years. I can't say that a certain internal population changes might not have, have had something to do with it. On the other hand, the declines in smoking were so great uh, that you would expect to see some difference in life expectancy during that time period. 
And, um, and we, we studied life expectancy declines and saw what diseases were uh, accounting for them the most, and it was heart disease and cancer, the sort of things you would expect to be declining if you had such falls in smoking. So I do think that the smoking contributed to that change. Uh, Dr. Farley, I suspect your perspective on health today is a bit different than you had when you finished medical school and mm -hmm. residency training. So right. could you talk a little bit about how we might want to look at training today to try to get our graduates to think big or have a different perspective? Because I suspect if we don't, we'll keep producing what we're producing now, which is not an answer to the problems that face uh, population health. Thank you. Yeah, uh, great question. I, I absolutely think that basic public health concepts should be taught in medical school uh, so that even if doctors are going to be clinical practicing doctors, which is a you know, wonderful role to play, that they are aware of what public health can do and can serve as advocates for public health, population health approaches. Uh, when I went to medical school, there was a school of public health there and I took some courses in it, but within my medical training, I didn't get anything on public health. I got a course in biostatistics that talked about clinical trials, um, had nothing to do with these concepts. Um, and actually, I, I wrote the book, I'm sorry that's a plug, but I did, I wrote the book um, <laughs> as a book that's a, as a stories of people so that it's kind of fun to read so that people would read it for that reason, but at the end they would kind of get, uh, understand these public health concepts. I think the broader that we have people understand these public health concepts, the more support we'll have and the more we can really make the kind of transformational change that we need to. Dr. Farley. Um, the billionaire mayor is uh, mentioned in the subtitle of your book. Yes. Can you talk about him and the imp – you said in your talk that you don't need a billionaire mayor to, to make this happen. In New York, you had the benefit of a billionaire mayor, I guess, in your, from your perspective, the benefit of a billionaire mayor. Right. Others may quibble about whether it was a benefit or not. But can you talk about him and the, the, the role that he played as a leader and um, his leadership style in this particular aspect of the work? Yeah, so uh, Mayor Bloomberg, as I said, he was a numbers guy. He understood the idea of saving lives wholesale rather than retail. Uh, he also was a manager. He had managed a big company, and he understood how one manages an organization. And a lot about what happens in city government is not a political right versus left thing. It's just simply how well do you run the machinery of government. And, uh, and so what he did was he said, I want the best possible people I can get as my appointees, um, and then I'm going to make sure that they are right on strategy but then after that, I'm going to get out of the way and let them run their agencies and, and encourage them to come up with innovative ideas. Uh, and so all of us felt very energized working for him that, that we, f we were actually being pressed to come up with big ideas. Uh, if we didn't come up with big ideas, he was going to get bored. Um, and, and if there was a big idea that sounded good, he was going to take a risk. And like a good manager, if you got into trouble, he had your back. Okay? And so... Uh, of course, I put my foot in my mouth, I made mistakes, uh, but I knew he was going to support me. And in many political systems, it's not like that. Uh, you know, if you do something that's embarrassing, you're the first to go, and in that turnover, things are not managed well. So his management style proved to be, I think, very much part of the successes we had in the city. Hi, my name is Shante Williams. I am at Shaw High School in the 10th grade, and I was wondering, what can we do with our families at home, our younger brothers, our parents, our grandparents, and more, to that's a think big so a solution? You know, um, if you ask two questions, what, what can you do for your younger uh, siblings? The younger siblings, partly, y you can, you know, people pretty much know what healthy habits are. People pretty much know what's healthy food and what's unhealthy food. Uh, but there's a lot of things that press us to do things that are unhealthy anyway. And having one little voice in the family that say, you know what, you really shouldn't be drinking a two-liter bottle of soda. You know, let's, yeah, I know you like it, know it tastes great, but you really shouldn't do that. That's got a, going to have more power than if I say that. Uh, but to your question on thinking big, I, I think it's, um, it really gets back to my early answer that young people speak with clarity on these issues, uh, and you shouldn't be afraid of asking uh, the questions about why does it, the world really need to be this way? If, if you don't ask that question, it won't get asked because older people uh, tend to accept what's been around. Hello, doctor. Uh, Lauren Anthes from Metro Health. Um, you talked about access. You also talked about behavior as indicators for outcomes. Right. And in Ohio, we're lucky enough to have expanded Medicaid. Uh, and I was, wondered, I was wondering about your perspective on some of the policy initiatives that are being discussed not only in Ohio but other states across the country 
that seem to have some punitive measures when it comes to access. In other words, co-pays, health savings accounts, drug testing, this sort of thing as, as measures to change behavior. Does, do sticks work better than carrots or is it a carrots only business? You know, I'm not really familiar with how those incentives work. I think in, in general, I would tend in my at least partial ignorance to not favor them uh, because you, so you want people to come in for basic primary care. You don't want to put barriers to that. Uh, that is, if done well, what prevents people from getting a hospitalization. Certainly, when somebody has a stroke, they're going to be hospitalized. That's not a that the access to the problem, even if they have no insurance. You want them to come in when they have high blood pressure uh, so they take their medicine. So you don't want to put in limits like that. Um, hi, doctor. Um, my name is Ariana Mack. I'm a sophomore at Gilmore Academy. And I was wondering, with this being the media age, as you previously mentioned, um, and texting and driving or being under the influence while you're driving being the leading cause in teenagers' death, um, how do you think we can make the message more of awareness and urgency of stopping doing that more apparent so in a way that people will pay attention to it? You're talking specifically around texting while driving. Yeah, I mean, it's, we certainly need to be educating about that. That might not be a bad um, topic for a media campaign, but there's also an enforcement element of that. Um, you know, a lot of people, I, just modify, I know people who haven't really taken it seriously until uh, they were pulled over because they were checking their cell phone at a stoplight. Uh, and it happens once, e even if there's no real penalty, even if it's just a warning, um, that can remind people and that may change their behavior. Uh, and, you know, in health, we, we tend to be big-hearted people who want nothing but to help, help folks. And so the word enforcement kind of sets our you know, teeth on edge. But there are times we need to actually enforce uh, policies that are really important to health, and uh, I think that's one of them. Hi. Uh, Dr. Farley, you mentioned Flint. Could you speak a little bit more about the intersection between public health and infrastructure, um, like water and those sorts of things? Uh, I'm not sure specifically what, what you want to talk about, but uh, and I will say this. We, everybody knows that we have neglected to invest in uh, maintaining and upgrading our infrastructure in this country over the last few decades. Uh, and so th there's a lot about our roads and bridges and, uh, and public transit that's, that's and schools that, that's falling apart. Um, you know, partly that's politics where people, there's some people who believe the government is always bad, so why put money into it? Uh, also partly though, we, we have to think about medical care. Medical care is sucking dollars out of other government services. Um, Public health needs to continue to be strong even when people want to disinvest. And I think the Flint is, case is a perfect example where uh, I don't know anything about the details, but gosh, how, how is it that the government fell down at, at that situation? Um, and it should be a cautionary note for all of us in public health. Thank you, Dr. Farley. I especially appreciate your comments about the media and how important that is. And with the young people in the room, um, this is a table of educators, of health professionals, and we know how important peer pressure is to young people. So I would say to the young folks, being a good role model for your friends is something that you can do, not just for your families. But being in New York City, did you ever consider um, getting actors or athletes, you know, famous people who are role models to so many people to do public service announcements or do some of that media campaign to make some of these healthy habits cool or whatever the latest word is. Yeah. And if you need an actor, I'm right here. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we, um, you know, wh when you do advertising campaigns, you have to think about do you want to use a celebrity spokesperson? And it has its advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that immediately it, it raises a level of attention to this. Uh, the disadvantage is now you have bought into this entire person's life. And if some skeletons come jumping out of its closet, uh, then suddenly you own those problems. Um, but we did do that. You know, th there's a, a basketball player uh, named Meta World Peace um, who is, uh, has had mental illness problems and is not afraid to talk about it. Uh, and so we've used him in a campaign that was a fairly small campaign uh, to talk about seeking care for, for mental health. And, uh, and it, you know, he was very genuine and I thought very uh, effective. Hi, um, my name's Kylie Scholl. I go to Jane Addams High School and I'm in the 11th grade. 
Um, I just want to know, Michelle's Obama's um, program changed our lunch schedule to where we have to have a fruit and vegetable to make us healthier at school. Do you know if it's affected anywhere else? Uh, yeah, that is a, um, it's a, it's a change in law that's happened in Washington and is re being required all over the country. Um, and there's been an awful lot of fuss in the political world around it, but it is working. Uh, the kids are uh, on surveys are eating healthier. Uh, and for all the complaints that kids wouldn't eat healthy food, in fact, they're not throwing out any more food than they were in the past. Uh, so it actually is a success. I mean, you know, if you're like me, you probably complain about the cafeteria food. That's, this happens, you know, for time immemorial. Nonetheless, it is healthier than it used to be. Uh, and, and people's health is going to benefit from that for a long time. Today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a forum with Dr. Thomas Farley, former commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and CEO of the Public Goods Project. Thank you, Dr. Farley. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.